So let's start with the first lecture um, called the perception. The perception is actually like the, the very, very, very basic unit that uh, powers all these deep learning and neural uh, networks. So first, an acknowledgement. Uh, some of the material or that I'm using is, was developed by Kevin McGuinness from Dublin City University and Santiago Pascual, also uh, one of the instructors of, of this course. In case you want to uh, review or an overview or another explanation about this topic, you have the video ready from Santi from last winter. So you just click here and you have this lecture in 20 minutes, but explained by, by Santi. Okay, so let's begin with uh, uh, something broader than the perceptron, which are the uh, one way to classify uh, different types of algorithms for machine learning. Um, in this lecture, in Perceptron and in the first uh, lectures of this course, we are going to focus on something called supervised learning. Okay. The supervised learning, according to Jan LeCun, will be the icing of a cake. Okay. So he's using this slide uh, lately to, to, to explain the difference between supervised learning, which is what we are going to talk about, and compared to pure reinforcement learning, which is what Oriol Vinyals will talk about when he comes, and unsupervised and predictive learning that we are going to deal uh, another day. Yeah? So as you see, the icing is just uh, the sugar over the, the cake. Like most of the machine learning, or that what the Alekun thinks that it's most of the machine learning, the interesting stuff is in the unsupervised, or he calls it predictive learning, and reinforcement learning in this slide or less, it's just something very, very, very specific. So, um, a more uh, formal definition of supervised learning. Supervised learning is when we aim at predicting a, a function, uh, f, that will map our uh, input data into uh, another output space. In the output, typically they are uh, labels, for example, if it's classification. In unsupervised learning, you just want to, to, you don't have labels at all, you just have lots of data and you want to, to model that data distribution mainly for whatever purpose, then you will see the purpose in the future. And in reinforcement learning, actually what you want to learn a function and you have some labels, but actually uh, the labels and the function that you learn, so you're not that interested in the why, but you want to solve another task, which is Z. And so you train a function to solve kind of another task. And, you'll, and again, you'll understand much better when Uriol Vinyals uh, explains it in when he comes. So now we'll focus on, so these are the, the days when we'll deal with unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning, and now we'll focus on supervised learning. Yeah, so we have input data and we have labels. So each, each input sample, we have a label or we have a prediction that, that we know what we want to generate. Examples for that, uh, that would be what I, uh, the example that I already mentioned about image classification. So imagine you have an image and you want to, in that image you want to predict there's a mite uh, that's it. This animal here, when this image has a container ship, and there's a motor scooter, or there's a leopard. Yeah. So your X in that case will be your image, and the Y will be the label that you want to predict for that image. Other options. So imagine that you have uh, some audio samples. So you can think about an audio sample as a, a window. So you have an audio signal, and you set a window over it, and you want to predict if in that window there is speech or there is no speech. And then to train that, you can just look at the window, and, 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 okay, if, and if you have labels, labels that tells you if in that window there's speech or not, you can train a model for that. Okay, so you have for each window, uh, one, two, another window, you can predict if there's no yes or yes speech. That would be the, the goal of, of a supervised learning problem for speech uh, detection. Um, so on supervised learning, uh, we are going we want to fit a function, uh, this f. Um, the input data can have any dim dimensionality, okay, rm. And we are going to, to have pairs of training samples. So for each uh, input data, we're going to have the label. So for each image, each uh, image label, for each window, uh, audio window, we're going to have either speech or not. Um, our goal is to learn this f, this uh, function, in a way which is uh, general. General, it can generalize well. It means that when this f, we expose it to new samples that we have never seen, so that we didn't use to, to train the model, that when we, we, he sees new samples, 
this f will still behave well. Yeah. So we, we, we want uh, if we have an image uh, detector that it detects cats and we show it him many images of cats, uh, we want that when we show a new image of a cat, one that has never seen, we want it to predict cat. Okay. There's, there's not there's not much merit if we if we show him many images of cat and then when we show the same image again, it predicts cat. The nice thing is when it generalizes well for new images. For doing that, in this course, and probably you are, many of you are already familiar with that, uh, we are always going to talk about training and test data, or in general, or training and validation data. So when we ha we're going to have these data sets, and normally we're going to take one part of the data to estimate the models of parameters, so to estimate this f function, and we're going to use another part of this data to evaluate how well this f function work or, or didn't work. That's the, the data used for training is, is, uh, is the, sorry, here it's, it's much clearer here. So that's the, the general abstraction of a supervised learning model that maybe you will be developing. So normally there's a training phase in which you have your training data. This means that you have your, your data x and your labels y. And the, here the task or the challenge is to fit this function in such a way that uh, this function will be stored in a model in, so that when we have new data, new test data x that has never seen, um, the model will allow a prediction algorithm to estimate a label for this new input data. Yeah, that's the classic approach that you will have. Um, when you train the model, you are in this part, and normally that's something that takes a lot of time, and that's when you are going to use the GPUs a lot, and it's, you will be complaining because your GPU is, is very slow and it takes hours or days to train. While at test phase or inference time or prediction time, that these are different ways to kind of mention the, the same thing, then it's when the model is running. Okay, so if you want, you're developing your, your, your you know, maybe you have a startup and you want to develop a, an, app, an app for the smartphone that, which is that one that's popular now, that, that takes pictures of uh, labels from wine bottles and, and you want to recognize these wine bottles. First you train the model, you do it uh, offline and on your, um, before releasing the product, before releasing the app. And when the model is, is trained, then when a user just sends one image of one picture of one label, you want a very quick inference to say, okay, that label corresponds to, to this wine. <clears throat> there are also uh, two types of um, supervised learning problems which are very classic. One of them is the regression problems and the other one is the classification problem. Um, and the main difference is depends on what's the, let's say, the labels, the output that we want for, for our model. In the case of a regression problem, this output label it uh, corresponds to an Rn space, and it's a continuous variable. So, for example, it would be if you want to predict a temperature uh, that you will have, for example, tomorrow. Okay, so, that, like, kind of, when you do weather forecast, you can predict any temperature, and it can suppose of a, a continuous value. On the other hand, there are the problems of classification, in which the label y is discrete. So, there's no, there's no continuity in the different y values that you have. Um, for example, you want to predict... Uh, label 1, 2, 5, 2, and 2. And now, now I'll get back exactly to what I mean with 1, 2, 5, 5, and 2, because you can tell me that this is also discrete. Uh, I'll get back to this later, but um, for the regression, imagine that um, one very simple model to the regression is to train what's called a linear regression. So it means just a, a very, very simple model in which you have your input data. Okay. If I do this. You have your Input data, in this case, it's, it's 1D, so your, your input data also only has one variable, so sorry, one dimension, so you can map it in this axis. And for each uh, input value, you want to uh, predict to regress a Y value. As all possible Y values are, are, can be predicted, it makes sense to have a mapping function between X and Y. Of course, this function could, could have any shape, if it's a general regressor. But in this case, as I'm dealing with uh, a linear regressor, 
uh, this is just a straight line, this fx. That's what, what if we estimate the parameters of this fx, we, we, could, we would have a regress. So one way to go from x to y. So that's the most basic and simple supervised learning problem probably that we can think about. What we need to do if we want to solve this problem, we need to estimate the parameters of, of this uh, line. And you know that the line, you just need to um, estimate the parameter W and B, so the bias and let's say a steep. Yeah, so if we have W and B, we know the, how to plot this line. We, we know to go from many X to, to a Y. So then the training a model just means estimating these W and B parameters. In the previous example, there was only uh, the input value had only one dimension, so I could plot it in the, in the horizontal axis, but of course, in many other problems, you're going to have much more than just one input value. You can have plenty. Now, in this case, we have a multidimensional input, but still, the linear regressor works the same way, just that, that the, the input axis, the input uh, now the input, yeah, the input axis, we have several, one for each dimension, but still we can plot that into a, in a Y value, into a single value for regression. For example, the one application for that would be estimating the price of, of a house. So based on uh, features like uh, how many square meters, uh, the location, maybe in latitude and longitude, so these are actual values, the year of the construction, um, you, we can uh, estimate the price. Somebody can 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 uh, can estimate, or you, you could train a linear regressor so that it learns these W parameters and the bias. And by doing that, whenever you have the input data, you can estimate a price. Yeah, in this case, the difference with respect to the previous one is that the input uh, vector has multi, uh, more than it's a multiple dimensions. We can have as many as we want. Now I just introduced the regression problem. I'm moving into the classification problem. Remember that classification problem, the difference now is the, that, that the output value uh, is, in classification is discrete value. So it would be like, let's say it could be uh, one to five, so something like uh, integrals. You cannot predict here like 1.1 1 .1 or 1 1.2 in this, in this example, while the regression had the continuous uh, values. One, pro, one example, of classification, which is the classic one in any probably machine learning course, is a spam filter for emails. So you receive an email and you want to classify between if this email is spam or not spam. In this case, there is no half a spam or 0 0.2 spam that doesn't make any sense at all. They are just uh, different classes. So how can, how can we do that? Now, you must, uh, when you look at the, at, the, at the figure, you must interpret that now that both axes uh, in this case, they correspond to um, the dimensions of, of the input data. Okay. Now, this, this is not the label now. The label now is represented by the color, blue or, or red. Uh, blue is spam and red is not spam. So let's say here you have the class. We have the class uh, not spam. And over there, we have samples from the class um, spam. In this case, I didn't label which kind of feature could, be, could this be. Um, so maybe, I don't know, I can invent it. I will invent it, and probably it will be wrong, but it could be maybe the, the length of the email, like how many words are there, and I don't know, and the time of, of the day. And that these are uh, some of the features you can extract from, a, from, a, from an email. Probably they are very bad features to solve this problem, but that's a possibility. So as we can classify between spam and spam, we can make much more complex problems for classification. This one is a very, very classic one uh, for the machine learning community to test classification, which is like given a collection or given a, a one handwritten digit, just tell me which is the, the number, the label, the digit that corresponds to the, to the pixels that you, that, that you show. Yeah, so now the class is the, from a number from zero to nine and the input, so the label is from zero to nine, and the input are the, the row pixels. So these pixels, you could, you, if you want, you can think that you can put all, all, uh, all the pixels one after the other as a, as a, a feature vector, 
and that will be your input, your x. And you want the output to be one and only one of these classes. Yeah? Um, this trick, sometimes that, that's a bit awkward for you, but it makes sense, that this trick of, okay, I, I want to deal with images, and I'm going to put them uh, just flatten. So, of course, flat images in this, this data set, it's a very popular data set called MNIST, and it's 28 by 28 pixels. And when you flatten, so you just have one single uh, vector of 784 dimensions, that's this product. And then you, you, can, uh, you can process images by doing that. Okay? So doing that probably is not a very good idea because mm, you, make, you make things difficult for the model, for the classifier, because you are kind of breaking the spatial information which is coded in a, in a two-degree grid. But depending on what you want to do, uh, that's, that's, that's good. I mean, um, in some of the projects that students did in previous ed editions of the seminar, they were not really uh, looking for having the best uh, classifier for the MNIST data set. They just wanted, don't know, maybe to, 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 to study what happened in, if in their model uh, they increase this parameter, they put this parameter or this other parameter, if they change things in the model. They, that, that's the goal of the experiment. And, and if you want to do that, um, it, it's fine to do this uh, flattening of the digits. Yeah? And people use this data set a lot because it's kind of small and it's well known by everybody. So everybody in the community, if you, depending on, or on what you want to show, uh, you say, okay, I use the MNIST data set and everybody knows what it is and you can focus on, on explaining what, what you want to study. Yeah? So I spent some time because that's very popular pretty sure that some of you will, at some point, will, will play with this data set. <clears throat> now, uh, I want to insist in something on the classification, um, especially where, so maybe, when, when we are doing this uh, classific, uh, problem, assuming a problem of classification, one way to understand it, maybe visually, it's, it's this one. Um, especially in the ImageNet or in the MNIST uh, case that we had earlier. Actually, what, what, what we are doing, this would be a, an example in which, uh, let's say, you would have an image classifier that can only uh, distinguish between uh, motorbikes, dogs, and bicycles, okay? And the basic approach to solve that, if you just do a, a classification uh, task, so the first problem that you, you will have is, okay, so I have uh, dogs, uh, motorbikes, and, and bikes. So how can I code in, in code that, uh, how can I represent the motorbike, or how can I represent the class dog, how can I represent the, the class bike? One very classic way to do it, and that's what everybody does in, in ImageNet or MNIST, is to use something called uh, the one whole representation. This means that uh, you have a, a vector as long as the amount of classes that you want to classify. And for when you have, and to have the label dog, you, you select a position on the vector and you, and you turn that into a one. And the other positions, they remain zero. And you want to have a label for, for bicycle, that's the position for bicycle, one, and the rest are zeros. Or uh, motorbike, this one is the position for motorbike. And that's a way of coding classes that will be very useful for you when you deal with this software. Yeah? So don't expect your classifier to really write doc, D-O-G, in a, in a basic approach, okay? You're, or, don't, or in this case, oh, so maybe it's, here it's clear. Uh, in this case, when you train a classifier like this, it will not output a, a one or a two or a three. What you will do is you will code each of these classes as a one-hot encoder. And maybe you can think that, so you will have 10 zeros and class zero will be the one in the first position, Class one will be a one in the second position, and so on. Yeah, that's the way to code classes in in these models. And that's and that's when we solve a classification problem. That's what we want to predict in the end, a one hot. So what, what I'm saying, we'll just go back. That when you have this scheme and you want to do the prediction and you want to predict dog, you will not have dog written. You will have a one hot encoding, and Ideally, you would like a one in the position for dog and zeros everywhere else. Okay? In practice, that's not exactly what will happen, but okay, you will get close to it. <coughs> Good. Okay, so now I introduce the regression and classification 
task. So now I just introduced a problem that actually two problems that we want to solve. And now I'm getting into the solution. So as this topic is called the perceptron, so I'm introducing you to the perceptron. That's this scheme. And that's what we are going to study. And we're going to see how this simple scheme can solve uh, both tasks, the regression and the classification task. Um, the perceptron, uh, it takes its name because it's kind of a, an analogy, so it's inspired from the biological neurons, okay? It's not trying to implement a biological neuron. It's like when the planes, they have wings because they are inspired by birds, but they, they work in an absolutely different way. That's, you must think about it in this way, okay? We are not trying to copy humans or anything like that. So the idea is that the biological neurons, what they do is they fire. So they have really, they generate some impulse when, um, let's say, they have some, some excitations on the inputs, they, they go over a certain threshold. And the perceptron, and you'll see now it's coming later, you see that it works in a different way. You have different inputs, uh, they are combined somehow, and then in the end there's, there will be some kind of activation that we are going to discuss in, in the next slides. Okay, but that, that's, that's the, uh, the analogy between one another. And that's why we talk about neurons and all that. Okay, let's look at architecture like in detail. Um, what do we have here? We have that this model, the perceptron, um, it has the following parameters. These, these are called weights. In this case, there are three weights, one weight for each of the inputs, and then uh, there's a bias. Yeah. If we know th these parameters, we fully characterize the perceptron. Or in other words, uh, when we say that we want to train the perceptron, remember earlier the, the graph about training and inference test? When we train, when we do the training, what we are tra doing is actually estimating these parameters, the weights and the, and the bias. If we do that here at this point, we have just a weighted sum and the bias. So I think you have already seen that before. Okay. Now, um, if you remember, I mentioned that with this scheme, we can solve both the regression and the classification task. Um, if we, we want to solve the regression task here, what we need, and we have this expression over here. Do you know what, what are we supposed to do in this block, this activation function? What do you suggest that we do? Hello. It, okay, that's, that's a super, okay, that's, that's a question just to know if you are following or, or not, and, or if you are very shy or not. So I, I go back again to the regression part, okay? So I explain again what's a regression part, well, just very quickly, because you've seen it already. So that was the regression part, okay? Just memorize that this formula. Can you memorize? Yeah, just grab it in your mind. And then, um, okay. And that's what we have at this point here. So if we, if we want to generate the same expression as the regressor, what, what should we do here? It's, it's a bit like a tricky question, okay? Sorry? One, which means, like, do nothing? I mean, so that's already the, the expression of the regression, right? So in, in this block, we don't need to do anything at all. Yes? So if you want to make the, the perceptron act like a regressor, this is, if you want just a straight line, doing nothing at all. That's, in a formal way, that's when we say that this F, it's the identity. Yeah. So the perceptron, in a, I don't know, in the most basic way, it, it's, it's kind of a, already a, a way, of, already a linear regressor. Yeah. If, if F is the identity, that goes straight and we are done. Hmm? So this architecture is already capable of doing linear regressor, which I think that all of you already knew, but 
maybe you're not familiar with the concepts and you are you are not uh, you don't feel comfortable with it. Then that was for the problem of regressor regression, and then for the other problem, the sigmoid problem. Uh, sorry, for the classification problem, the only difference is that now this activation function is a function called the sigmoid, and I will, I will explain what the sigmoid function is. Okay, but that's the difference. So if you want the perception to work to work as a linear regressor or a classifier, almost. Actually, there will be something else, but almost like a classifier. The main difference is the is this activation function. Whether the activation function is the identity, that, which is like nothing, or the activation function in this case is a sigmoid. Yeah. The sigmoid. That's uh, what the sigmoid sigmoid looks like. Here you have the expression, and what's interesting to to know about the sigmoid is that it's fit between zero and one. So it goes from zero to one on the top. Yeah, and of course it has its low, but so it just uh, stays at on one there on top and zero <coughs> over here. And this function is differentiable, which in the future lectures you'll notice that that's super, super important. But not today, but just remember that it's continuous, so it's differentiable, and that's important for the back propagation. As you will see in the future, okay, in future lectures. So what? So how how do do we go from the output of the sigmoid to a classifier? So in this case, uh, I'm addressing the problem of binary classification. So I only have, I just want to solve the problem of giving some inputs to know if they belong to class, uh, let's say, red or blue, and that's all. Then what you do is you, is you if you have the perceptron with the sigmoid function. Um, all the uh, input values, they will be, ma they will be mapped at, to some point of this sigmoid. So this means that uh, they will be, in general, or most of them, they will be very close to zero, or they will be very close to one. Yeah? Of course, there's still this central area, which here you see it very, very long. Uh, <coughs> sorry, yes, like very, very large. But in general, you don't, you don't want to have samples <coughs> over there. And when you train the model, you make it in such a way that most samples, they go really to very high values or very low values. And that's the way you train and how you classify. Actually, the final step for classification, it's like, so you, again, you have the input. It goes through the activation function. So here you have the sigmoid with, uh, where the input is the, the linear combination. And now uh, this, this output here. These are called the logits. And then there's a final step, which is like for classification, which is like having a threshold, like saying, okay, so all the values which are over a certain value, so for example, all the values which are over, typically it would be like over 0 0.5, they correspond to that class, and you, all the values which are below 0 0.5, they correspond to the other class. And that's how you solve the, the binary classification problem. Yeah, and and you see that with a with a perceptron, we can also uh, predict classes. Not not only regress with a linear regressor, but we can also predict between two classes. Okay, so I guess that some of you are already thinking how I'm going to do. I want to predict more than two classes, but by now with two classes, it's it's enough. Yeah. Uh, gra an, a graphical representation of what's going on. Um, so again, here I'm, I'm, I'm going again through the threshold. Here you have the sigmoid. Uh, you have the, the, the linear weighting and the bias, the, weight, the weights, the bias. This will be if you want to do linear regressor, you, we would just look here. When you, if, you, if you have this, if the, you look at the, at the output of the perceptron and you and you, don't, you have the identity, activation function, you look at this figure, and in this case, you, could, you would be training uh, a linear regressor. And in the other case, as it's, as it's over here, sorry, this should be, you should be circling all this expression. Maybe I can, maybe I can solve this, sorry. Now, actually, what, what you are kind of doing is uh, mapping a sigmoid on, on top of this. So you, are, you must look at 
but in the symptom on top of it. And doing that, we can somehow even uh, predict the classes and even estimate kind of the probabilities that of one class or another, if that's a binary classification. Yeah? So just to, to wrap up, um, the same scheme of the perceptron can be used as a linear regressor or uh, if you want a logic logistic regressor that allows doing classification. To the classification, you you have the sigmoid activation function and you put the threshold, let's say typically 0 0.5, and then you can have the two classes. But now, with this approach, we can, also, we can only classify between two classes. And of course, we want to deal with problems which are more uh, challenging. Yeah? So do you have any idea about how can we deal with more classes? What can, what can we do? If one perceptron can distinguish between two classes, what could we do? And now imagine that we have three classes. Any idea? Yes? Yes, several perceptrons. So, so we have three classes. We can have three perceptrons. And now the intuition, uh, the intuition is that now each perceptron will predict if the input sample belongs or not to each of the classes. OK, so, so um, before there was the dog, the bike, and the bicycle, right? So we'll have one perceptron that will predict bicycle. And then one class, let's say this class will be bicycle, and the other class is no bicycle. And that's the output of one perceptron. Now I have another perceptron about the motorbike. And you probably predict uh, motorbike or no motorbike. And another perceptron, that would be dog, it was. So dog and no dog. Yeah? You can, you can think that uh, maybe it's a bit, uh, so you are kind of predicting a little bit too much because if, if it's if if let's say if it's if there are only three possible classes and it's not a motorbike and it's not a bike, it must be a dog. Okay, so in, in that sense you can think that it's not that necessary the last one, but uh, you see that that allows later to to estimate some probability some probability <coughs> values that that help in having a confidence on how good the the prediction is. So let's let's go to this now. Now we move from binary classification to multi-class. So as many classes as, as you want. Um, what we are going, what I'm going to introduce now is something called the softmax classifier, which is a way to, based on this idea of I, I have as many perceptions as classes I want to predict, at the end I will have some probability values, probability like in the sense that they give a confidence of the prediction. It's not, we are not doing any Bayesian thing there, but in the sense that, that everything adds to one, that's the sense of the probabilities that we're going to estimate. Um, and the softmax classifier or softmax layer is will do this final step. So this first uh, scheme I show you here, actually, this just it, it's a binary classifier. So there are only two classes, y1 and y2. So actually, this problem could be solved with only one perceptron. But as we have seen in the past, one perceptron, one threshold, and we classify between two classes. But in the same way, we could also have uh, just if you just look over here, that will be one perceptron, okay? And over here, you have another perceptron. Can you see the two perceptrons there? Of course, th there's this additional layer, but that I'm going to this layer. So two classes, Y1, Y1 and Y2, two perceptrons. So um, if you have this linear combination, then you do this softmatch operation. It's what, what I present here. So actually, um, it's kind of similar to the, to the sigmoid, but so you have an exponential, um, uh, you have the power at the exponential for each of the outputs. For each, so for each class, you look at the, at the output of, of each of the perceptrons, and then you normalize by the sum of the outputs of all the perceptrons. And this way, as you will do this for each of the class, in this case it will be just two classes, K, K1 and K2, um, you, you are sure that when you add all these probability values, they add to one. 
That's that's the trick. Because otherwise, if you don't do that, if you just if you just uh, uh, take these these points here and you add the um, the sigmoid function, there's no there will be no certainty that the that the sum of of these outputs adds to one. You need to to add some normalization. Okay. So before this normalization, this output it's called uh, I think it was here. Yeah, here. This is called logits. Okay, but but if you have three perceptrons and you add the logits of the three perceptrons, they don't need to add to one. Probably probably they will never add. But then if you add this new layer for normalization, this softmatch layer, uh, they add to one and then you have a much cleaner and, and better estimation of what's going on. Yes? But you said that that's not interpreted as probability. Um, there's nobody touched frequencies or anything like this. I mean it's it's interpreting the probability in the sense that it adds to one, but there's no direct, uh, I don't know, frequency terms or anything like that. No, so there's no prior, no Bayesian, anything like on that. But people call it probabilities, but it's it's computed this way, okay? Yeah. Um, okay. If you want the three classes that we were mentioning earlier, uh, so the dog, bicycle, and motorbike, uh, we'd have, we just have one more perceptron, the softmax is always the same layer, and that's it. And if you want to solve ImageNet, there are 1,000 classes, so you have 1,000 perceptrons, and for each input image, you can estimate the probabilities. Actually, I think, I yeah. You can estimate the probabilities, yeah? Um, one final message is I want you to be aware of the amount of parameters that you need to estimate to to train these models. Actually, it's, you, you see it quite well here already, but uh, here you have it in matrix, uh, matrix notation. Yeah, so you have for each of the output labels, you have the weights that connect with, with, with each of the inputs and the bias. And that's actually normally you will find uh, the softmax classifier express uh, this way. As I mentioned before, if you had these 100 or 1,000 classes, so you will have as many n classes, you have as many perceptrons as, as classes you want to predict. Finally, uh, what's the effect of the softmax? Uh, here you have on the top graph, that would be the outputs of some logics that you could have. Actually, just notice that logics can, can take negative values as well. There's no boundary there. And, and here below, you see the effect of taking these values and going through the softmax normalization. Yeah, so as, as there, there's an exponential term here, of course, like large terms, they, they survive, and small ones, they tend to disappear. So you see that that's the effect that, that you obtain uh, by doing this normalization. You know, the, the, all the, small, the smaller values, so here this one seems very important, but compared to the other one, that's much smaller. Great, so I'm almost done now, just uh, for the next episode, uh, next week. Um, so far, um, I introduced the perceptron to be able to do this, the linear uh, regression and let's say kind of uh, logistic regression and the classification. And I guess that I show very nice examples where I just draw a, a straight line and all the samples were in one side and all the samples in the other side. But normally that's not the case. If you try to classify things like images or audio or text and you kind of project these data samples in the in a, in a space of n dimensions, they don't get so separable, so easy to separate with a, with a linear boundary. And you obtain things like this, right? So if you obtain samples, samples distributions of, like this one, you want to distinguish between green and red, uh, things become much more challenging, yeah? And so I want you to think about this challenge um, and come back next week and we'll tell you how you can solve this with the tools that we introduced today, okay? So I don't know if there are any final questions.